Thank you very much. Um, and Fl Florian, thank you uh, once again for inviting me, and uh, congratulations on such an excellent conference again this year. Well, it's wonderful, very wonderful. <laughs> the, uh, it's wonderful to see this audience here. I know I'm the last speaker before the break, so I will try to respect the time here. And uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about cancer cachexia and some of the challenges we faced with this. Here are my disclosures. Uh, let's start with an international consensus definition, which I think has really helped this area uh, uh, significantly, and that's that while we think about weight loss uh, in the patient with cachexia, really the central feature of cachexia has to do with skeletal muscle wasting, uh, with or without fat loss, uh, that really can't be reversed fully by conventional means. There's a number of processes which cause this to happen, including infection, heart disease, pulmonary disease, but cancer has been at the forefront of this for study, and we know that uh, the disease process leads to a decrease in muscle mass, leading to decrease in strength, uh, mobility, anorexia fatigue, and quality of life are all affected. At the same time, there are metabolic effects, de decreasing protein stores, effects on metabolism, effects on immune function, again, with the ultimate result on the patient of decreased independence, uh, increase in hospitalization, decreased responsiveness to chemotherapy, increased toxicity, and ultimately uh, shortened survival. We don't measure muscle mass routinely in practice, but if one looks at the work of Barakos and others where they measure muscle mass by CT imaging here in a population of patients with solid tumors, lung cancer, and GI cancer, you can see that uh, in the normal range of body mass index, there's a significant number of patients who will have muscle wasting as part of this. Below a, muscle, uh, uh, below a uh, body mass index of 20, 100% of patients will have muscle wasting. But in the normal range of body mass index, maybe 40, 50% of cancer patients still have significant muscle wasting. And even in the obese patients, it may be as many as 20%. So looking at weight alone is not adequate, and muscle mass measurement ultimately will be the best test. Meanwhile, we've been looking mainly at weight loss as a presentation of patients that may correlate with muscle wasting. And if one looks at patients with lung cancer, the majority of patients at the time of diagnosis will have significant weight loss and likely significant muscle wasting. If we look at practice guidelines that have been developed through the European Palliative Care Research Collaborative, uh, we know that nutrition can be helpful. We know that nutritional counseling, psychotherapeutic interventions, uh, and physical training all can be somewhat helpful in ameliorating some of the side effects of cachexia, but can't fully reverse it. On the other hand, if we look at pharmacologic interventions, really there's no consistent recommendations. Thalidomide, cannabinoids, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, megase, and other agents haven't consistently affected weight in terms of muscle mass. Steroids may have had some short-term benefit. So it's really led to a new era of study of muscle wasting, and there are now new therapeutic approaches that are available. One column looks mainly at interference with atrophy signaling. These are myostatin, activin uh, inhibitors, and others that interfere with the inflammatory cytokines that occur in cancer. The other uh, approach is to stimulate the muscle directly, and that's been done through anabolic steroids as well as ghrelin mimetics. And we'll talk about those two classes of agents because we now have phase three data available for both. If we look initially at selective androgen receptor modulators, these are agents that uh, have some of the properties of androgens but have re eliminated things such as hirsutism and other negative effects uh, of androgens. And one of the first in class is a drug called Enobosarm. And this is a drug that in phase two trials led to an increase in lean body mass and increased physical function in a number of studies in cancer cachexia as well as sarcopenia of the elderly. Two randomized phase three trials were done. I presented some of this data last year, and I will update it for you today. Uh, one was in uh, platinum and taxane patients. The other was in platinum and non-taxane. These are stage four patients initially diagnosed, um, and they were given enobosarm versus placebo. And the primary endpoints of the study were to look at changes in lean body mass measured by DEXA scan and physical function as measured by steer climb power. Uh, we also looked at the durability of effect and overall survival as well as quality of life. If one looks at the baseline characteristics, half of the patients met criteria of cancer cachexia diagnosis, meaning 
more than 5% loss of body weight, but the other half did not. So this was really a prevention and a treatment study at the same time. If we look at what happened in the platinum taxane study, 504, there was an increase in lean body mass over time, as shown in the blue line. Meanwhile, the placebo group showed continued loss of muscle mass over this time course. Uh, if we look at 505, the same analysis occurs. There wasn't as much of a change uh, I'm sorry, in, in 504 in the steer climb power. We saw an improvement in steer climb, particularly at day 84, but also at day 147, when there's a, a decline in physical function in the placebo group. So clear differences in the first study in both lean body mass and uh, steer climb power. In the non-taxane study, however, again, we saw the increase in lean body mass, but not as clear an effect with steer climb power. It did not correlate as it did in the first study. Interestingly, even though we saw these changes in lean body mass, we did not see a real effect on body weight, which would not have been predicted uh, anyway, since this drug we do not believe has any direct effect on, uh, on weight or appetite. But if one just looks uh, uh, quickly at what changes, you can see that in the treated group of the Novus arm in blue, clear increases in lean body mass in both studies, more pronounced in the first study than the second, and clear losses in lean body mass in the second group as patients are being treated with chemotherapy for lung cancer. So we wanted to look at some further analyses to understand this better, looking specifically at lean body mass response, meaning maintenance or improvement, to see what impact that would have. And one can see that if one does that analysis, then there's a clear difference uh, in both studies in terms of steer climb power if one measures it based on a responder's analysis for lean body mass. There's also an effect on quality of life in that the lean body mass responders were more likely to improve their quality of life than, the, uh, than those who did not. And there's a survival difference in favor of the lean body mass responders. <clears throat> now, I must say, in the overall analysis, there was not a difference in survival in, by intent to treat. But this speaks to the importance of lean body mass preservation and an increase in quality of life, in survival, uh, and in function. So the conclusions of the study were that uh, advanced non-small cell lung cancer patients have severe muscle loss, excuse me. Oh, that's better. <clears throat> and uh, function impairment at diagnosis, it declines further with platinum therapy. The Inovasarm treatment um, was associated with an increase in lean body mass compared to a decline in lean body mass in the placebo group. I'm losing my voice at the wrong time here. Um, and the uh, Inovasarm treatment did, did perform better in terms of steer climb power in the taxane study, but not the other. But regardless of treatment arm, the lean body mass patients who sh showed response had improvement in physical function, survival, and maintenance of quality of life really pointing to the fact that lean body mass is an important outcome for our patients that we need to understand better. So the second agent to talk about is ghrelin. This is an, uh, often known as the hunger hormone. It stimulates food intake and stimulates the release of growth hormone and IGF-1 uh, and may decrease inflammatory cytokines. So it has an effect both on the axis of eating as well as potentially on muscle. And uh, a, a receptor agonist of ghrelin, anamorelin, has been developed uh, to be studied. Two studies have been reported, Romano 1 and Romano 2. We heard a little bit about this from Dr. Scotty earlier in the uh, ESMO presentations earlier um, this year. This was a presentation by Dr. Bonomi at the Chicago meetings just a month or so ago. These trials were done specifically, again, in lung cancer patients, but they were done in patients that already had established cachexia, meaning 5% weight loss or greater. They were randomized 2 to 1 to anamorelin or placebo and assessed over a 12-week period of time. The co-primary endpoints here, again, was DEXA scan measurement of lean body mass, as well as a functional assay of hand grip strength in the non-dominant hand. Large studies both included secondary endpoints of body weight, quality of life, uh, and measurements of uh, uh, anorexia and cachexia and overall survival. You can see by baseline characteristics that uh, these patients were not all at the beginning of treatment, but were in the midst of therapy, often six months to eight months on average from diagnosis at the time they were enrolled. Uh, as I said, they all met criteria of cancer cachexia, but most were still on active therapy, over 80%. If one looks at lean body mass, again, one sees a significant improvement 
in the patients on the Anna Moreland study. This is in Romano 1. And uh, one can see a decrease in the placebo group. And in this study, one also sees a significant improvement in, in body weight, almost two kilogram increase in lean body, a one, one kilogram increase in lean body mass and a two kilogram increase in body weight. This happens very quickly. Again, one can see within a matter of weeks, lean body mass, body weight increasing uh, while, the, while the control group has a uh, decline or stability. Now, as it was also noted, this other uh, functional me measurement, hand grip strength, was negative really in both trials. It declined in both groups, so no correlation with changing of uh, physical function, unfortunately, a, a physical measurement with this, this physical function test. Uh, what did change, however, were some quality of life metrics, patient reported outcomes, particularly in Romano 1. Uh, the fact anorexia cachexia domain was significantly better with the anamorlin uh, treatment versus placebo. And in uh, Romano 1, there was a difference in the fatigue scale with ma maintenance of fatigue uh, or lessening of fatigue compared to worsening of fatigue in the placebo group. This was seen in the uh, Romano 1 trial, but was not seen actually in Romano 2. But the changes in the anorexia cachexia domain was seen in both. So I was a discussant at this uh, presentation, and I asked the question, do we think that the Romano 1 and Romano 2 studies, for that matter, are practice changing? I think the pros are that anamorlin treatment was associated with an increase in lean body mass and body weight, along with significant improvements in patient-reported outcomes in an advanced lung cancer population where this has been very hard to see. No significant safety concerns were there, and as we've mentioned, the existing therapies are really inadequate. The uh, con side of this is despite significant improvement in lean body mass with anamorlin, no difference was seen in functional assessment as measured by hand grip strength. Body weight and uh, the patient report outcomes were secondary outcomes for the trials. And regulatory authorities have been uh, pretty firm on looking for more than lean body mass as a significant impact on, on, on an agent that uh, can be approved. They'd prefer quantitative endpoints such as functional improvement to perhaps more qualitative endpoints, although perhaps that's not uh, uh, everyone's viewpoint. But I think the clinical question here is, if you had a drug today in your clinic that improved appetite with resultant improvement in body weight and lean body mass with minimal toxicity, would you, do, would you prescribe it for patients with cancer cachexia? Certainly when we ask this question in the United States, I think the uh, overwhelming answer is yes. This, this would be a, an important agent to have available in our clinics for our patients. So in conclusion, I think the Romano trials pro do provide a rich database, just like the uh, Inobosarm studies, to better understand the impact of weight loss and muscle wasting on outcomes in patients with lung cancer. I think a pathway to regulatory approval of anamorlin will be a major step forward in the treatment of cancer cachexia, but it is something that will take some discussion with regulatory agencies both in Europe and the U.S. to see what data they will require uh, to approve an agent like this. Further studies of both these agents, as well as others in development, I think will help us dissect the complex uh, biology and therapy of muscle wasting in patients. And this is important not only for cancer cachexia, but for all of the other muscle wasting disorders that we see in medicine, including heart failure, COPD, renal dialysis, chronic infections, and the uh, increasing uh, number of patients with age-related sarcopenia. So I uh, thank you, and I will take any questions. Thank you very much. Merci pour cette, uh, ce passionnant exposé. Avez-vous des questions à poser sur ces molécules Oui. Bonjour tous. Bonjour. Well, good morning, everybody. Une petite question. Uh, J'ai des patients qui me disent me, je, ne, je mange pas I can't parce eat. que j'ai une perte eat. de goût. Because I don't have any taste Alors, left. Perte de goût, en train de la perte so, en train since there's no taste, there's no appetite, so there's anorexia, Au lieu de and nourrir so ces patients, right est-ce qu'il n'y a pas un moyen pour stimuler le goût, pour changer leur goût, pour manger par, seulement pour vivre, pour Just manger. so that they eat to survive, you know, to live. Thank you. Yeah. I think the, the, the issue of taste is a, is a difficult one. I think we know that taste is a big factor in, in weight loss for a lot of our patients. Um, and the, uh, <laughs> you get your headset on. Um, 
We, we know that we know that taste is a major factor in patients. We don't fully understand the, the biology of why this happens with radiation, with chemotherapy, with cancer itself. Uh, there have been a number of studies done trying to stimulate taste through different mechanical uh, techniques. Um, most of them have not been overly successful, but I do think the standard nutritional advice of, of using uh, salty uh, things with excessive salt, things that will help stimulate the taste, has been one thing nutritionists have recommended to our patients. But uh, I think we under need to understand that access better than we do currently. I don't think we have a standard therapy that can reverse uh, the loss of taste our patients have now. Oh, so Jeff, yes. Jeff uh, nice talk. Yeah. Nice talk. Uh, uh, more data than last year. <laughs> I have two short questions. One, side effects, because in the past can get clots, etc. But my main question is that um, in the past, uh, when I went to Sankakexia, like talks, uh, the people in the field always told me that you better do a proactive intervention. In other words, you get a, a person, patient with uh, pancreatic cancer. So basically from day one, you should start doing this type of intervention in terms of of increasing the weight loss. That once the patient is already has lost a lot of pounds, anything you do is not as, as optimal. Okay, so um, uh, for the point number one on uh, side effects, I didn't touch on that in, in, in any detail. Uh, in Obasan, we did not see significant side effects. We didn't, uh, there was concern, it's an androgen, would we see liver dysfunction, other things, but it didn't fall out. There really wasn't any significant side effects. Uh, and no virilization, no androgen type side effects that we were concerned about. So in that agent, nothing. Uh, for anamorlin, also very well tolerated. There was a, a difference in terms of glucose intolerance. There are some patients that developed hyperglycemia, a relatively small percent, but that was seen with anamorlin. But both agents seem relatively safe. So compared to megastrol acetate, the agent we know induces DVT and other risks, we don't see anywhere near that ty type of uh, safety concern with either agent. So uh, I think they would both be safe in practice. Uh, in terms of when to intervene with these agents, uh, I agree with you. I think the earlier the better. Uh, certainly waiting until patients have end-stage cancer cachexia that we all recognize is, is too late in the natural history. So trying to do this much earlier in the course makes sense. That's why the Inobosarm trials we, we uh, used was at the beginning, at least of, of stage four disease, at the time of initial therapy in prevention and treatment. Um, it's hard to compare across studies. We did see more muscle change in our studies than we're seeing in the other lung cancer trials with anamorlin, whether that's difference in, in the agents or whether it's difference in the duration of therapy or the fact that their patients were further along. All their patients did already have established cancer cachexia. Um, so, but I think when we have agents, uh, uh, available in the clinic, I think the earlier we can use them, the better. And I think the most important thing will be to begin to measure uh, lean body mass uh, routinely in the clinic, which we can do now with these CT imaging. So it can, be, it can become a routine test. Uh, okay. um, uh, Jeffrey, until now yes. we use uh, uh, magistrol or uh, a corticosteroid to control uh, important severe anorexia. Do you judge ethical to do a study with amorelin versus placebo? First question. Second question. The results of amorelin are statistically significant, but from the clinical point of view, you consider it clinically relevant, these results? Yeah, okay, so uh, t two very important questions. Uh, the first, is, is, it, is it ethical to be doing placebo-controlled trials uh, in cancer cachexia? I, I would say yes, because I think if one looks at the information we have, the available agents are really not sufficiently active and have significant side effects. So uh, steroids only have a very short-term benefit and clearly would have longer-term side effects if they were used over a long period of time. Uh, Megastrol acetate, again, significant risk of deep venous thrombosis and increases weight, but increases, uh, does not increase muscle mass. It increases um, fluid. So uh, the, the, we don't have a really uh, good comparator. So I think it is appropriate to, to have placebo-controlled trials in this setting because I don't think we have uh, an agent that, that meets consensus guidelines of everyone saying is a useful agent in cancer cachexia. Um, in terms of 
Um, the second question was, yeah, yeah, clinical relevance, yes. Um, so I think uh, the trial we did with Inovus arm was five months in duration. The trial done with Anamorlin was, was only 12 weeks. We clearly see a couple kilograms of increase in body weight in, within 12 weeks in those patients on average. Uh, we see more than a kilogram of increase in lean body mass. We, we know there's an association of lean body mass with these endpoints I talked about in terms of physical function and, and quality of life. So I, I, I believe it will become clinically significant uh, when used over a longer period of time. But whether these trials as in and of themselves now uh, are adequate or not, I think remains to be seen. I think it's also interesting to compare these two agents in terms of um, their effects. They clearly do what we expected them to do from preclinical study. So with Inobosarm, it clearly had a muscle effect, but nothing else. With Anamorlin, clearly it was an effect on appetite that was well seen in both studies, and that was associated with weight gain and muscle gain. So I think, I think we're at least now having agents that uh, the biology predicts what will, what will happen clinically, and I think it remains to be seen how long and in what setting they'll be most clinically useful. Last question for Chagala. Uh, a comment and a question. Uh, first of all, uh, the questioner made a uh, point about taste and, uh, and uh, eating to survive. Um, there, uh, we have uh, evidence that indeed anorexia um, at uh, baseline is a strong predictor of survival. If you have any anorexia versus none in patients with lung cancer based on 600 patients. Uh, secondly, there were older studies done where even intravenous uh, uh, total peripheral nutrition, parenteral nutrition was done, and it uh, had a negative effect on survival, not positive. So people really aren't eating to live, unfortunately. Uh, Jeff, that was uh, uh, a really interesting and wonderful uh, presentation and different, and thank you very much, uh, loaded with data. Did patients who responded to treatment, because you showed this interesting aspect of patients who had the uh, increase in muscle mass, did those patients who responded to treatment or was that analysis done, did they tend to have an increase in either weight or muscle mass? Uh, yes. Yes. So I think uh, in the, st in the we, we, we saw that in the Enobosarm trials, it hasn't been looked at yet that I know of in the Anna Moreland studies. But in fact, that was one of the confounding factors is patients with, on chemotherapy uh, in advanced stage lung cancer that had a, a response to their cancer often also had an improvement in lean body mass. Even, even on the, the placebo even, arm. Right, and on the placebo arm, even in the face of, of treatment. So obviously responding to chemotherapy is still a good thing, um, and uh, that may be helpful for those patients. But I think over and above that, there was a greater degree of increase in response in uh, patients on the Inovosarm treatment. So th there was some differential effect, and clearly a big difference in terms of the decline. So the patients that were not responding, that were declining, were declining a lot faster in the um, control group than in the Inovosarm group. And, and Jeff, do we know if those patients who responded had a positive uh, effect on the hand grip strength or the stair climbing? Um, Responded to chemo. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think we've done the analysis strictly based on chemotherapy response, um, but we know lean body mass responders in general had a clear improvement in their uh, stair climb power. So I, I think that would probably be true.